Um, so we are starting with our program now. I am very privileged to be able to welcome Chris to the stage, or Chris Cheslak. Yes. yes. Yeah, we've been practicing. Um, so Chris is a software developer and consultant. Um, he's the author of several OSS projects, and we had a little chat. I just needed to check OSS. It is not uh, operational system software. It is, in fact, open source software, but I'm sure you all knew that. Um, so Chris is the author of several um, open source uh, software projects, including Ionide, Forge, and Fornax. I'd heard of some of those. I'm sure some of you have, too. So Chris is a big deal. And he is focusing on, he, his passion is focusing on dev experience and tooling. He's also a prolific speaker, having spoken at around 40 events in the last four years. So let's welcome Chris. We can do a normal applause now. <laughs> we'll do an Icelandic clap later, but we'll do a normal applause now. And Chris, over to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, so uh, welcome you again. Everyone is welcoming you, so I guess that's what we should do. Uh, this will be a talk about language server protocol, about editor tooling, about IDs. And before going any further, uh, I have a couple of questions. What is your favorite ID? Visual Studio Code, anyone? Raise your hand. Any JetBrains products? Visual Studio? Yeah, no one. <laughs> uh, Vim? Emacs, yeah. That's my man. <laughs> oh, Vim. Uh, OK, so yes, my name is Chris. Uh, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, I'm mostly tweeting about functional programming and open source, about traveling and hiking and photography uh, and things like that. So I've, as Hannah mentioned, I've created a couple of open source projects. I guess the most important in context of this talk is a project called Ionite. And Ionite is a set of plugins for Visual Studio Code that trans transforms Visual Studio Code into a really powerful F Sharp ID. And F Sharp is a functional programming language for .NET platform, if you don't heard about that. Uh, so yeah. So why, why, why I'm talking about editor tooling and what's my, my kind of my background story and why I'm here on this stage. Uh, so I've started my adventure with editor tooling a couple of years ago with Atom. Anyone still using Atom? Oh, the that's interesting. Like kind of Atom died basically. So, so Atom was, was this super uh, cool idea from GitHub. Uh, to create super hackable editor of 21st century. So in old style editors, Emacs, I guess, is this most hackable editor that you can do anything with it and, and change that to your operating system if you want. Uh, so GitHub attempted to do something like that with Atom. Uh, it was fine. I've created a couple of plugins. Uh, Back then, those couple of years ago, I've started to maintain F Sharp language server called FS Alpha Complete. And what is actually language server? I will discuss that in a moment. Then I've got invited to a private preview by Microsoft of the Visual Studio Code extensions API because if you remember, Visual Studio Code when first was announced in beta, uh, it didn't have extensions, uh, which was really interesting choice uh, because yeah, <laughs> releasing editor in 2015 or whatever was the year without extension API was really, really interesting choice by Microsoft. Uh, but Microsoft is famous for making really interesting choices. So, I mean, <laughs> that's kind of like fitting. Uh, so yeah, but suddenly they've decided, well, I guess not suddenly, that was planned all the way, but they've decided that they will, when they will release 1.0 version of Visual Studio Code, it will include extensions and because of, of my work with, with Atom, I've got invited to private preview uh, of this extension API. I've worked with, with team at Microsoft for a couple of weeks on that. Uh, then during this time period, I've ported all my extensions from Atom to Visual Studio Code. And that was really interesting because I've worked for on those Atom extensions for years, maybe, well, maybe years is too much, but around one year at the moment when they've invited me to the private preview. And I've managed to port the biggest one, so F Sharp support in one week, uh, which was really, really, and re-implement all the same features. 
which was really, really, really cool because that showed that Microsoft actually had done something good. Yeah, the Visual Studio Code is one, one, one place where I say positive things about Microsoft, so. Uh, so yeah, so, so, so Ionite, because that's the F-Sharp extension, is, is kind of was featured as a featured extension on, on the day zero when Microsoft announced the marketplace. And it's on the, on the, on the Microsoft documentation page on, and official marketing page for .NET, which is also really I'm, something I'm really proud of. Uh, but the most important thing actually of this story is that for the last couple of, well, earlier this year, for a couple of months, I've worked with Microsoft uh, to implement language server protocol based uh, version of F-Sharp -F language server. And yeah, we cannot, we cannot talk about editor tooling at all without talking a bit about compilers. Uh, anyone created their own lang programming language? Yay. Uh, I guess, I guess if, you, if you've been at, the, at, at so, some university that has compiler 101 course or, or you've read something, something around this idea, uh, you, will, you, you probably know something like that. So, so compiler is very often treated as this step-by-step -step process. There are several phases of the compilation. Initially, you just send it a bunch of files. It do magic, 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 and then outputs whatever you want to do. And we, we won't go into what's, what's the magic, like it doesn't really matter. What is important is that this one-on-one -on -one basic naive approach that you can read in, in books or you've learned at the un at university, uh, it's kind of treating compiler as a black box, as batch mode utility that you execute once, it does something inside, you don't know what really, you just get stuff. And what's, what's really important is also every of the step is also treated as a, a smaller black box. So even from compiler design point of view, something is happening in lexer phase, something is happening in parser phase, something is happening in the later phases, but you don't have any way to introspect what's, the, what's, what's happening. You, you just treat that, uh, treat that as a kind of function composition of steps, just pipeline that you get the data, do transformation, push it to next step. Uh, on the other hand, we have modern editor tooling. Uh, and modern editor tooling has several, several features that I, I like to talk about. It needs to be rich, so there need, needs to be like a lot of information, a lot of stuff that you get from it, as many as possible, I guess. Uh, at the same time, it needs to be unintrusive, so it needs to, it, it doesn't need to, well, uh, how to say that correctly in English. Uh, uh, it shouldn't stop, it shouldn't break flow of developer. So it shouldn't be a tooling in a form of something hiding your code, for example. Uh, Visual Studio is especially lovely in that oh, you open object browser to, to, to browse some API. It puts some view on top of your code and you don't see your code anymore and that's kind of like totally disconnected from your code. Uh, it should be correct, uh, obviously. So if you get a list of, of, of items in autocomplete because you've done system dot, you kind of assume that this list is complete and full and everything is in this list. Like you don't expect you, you shouldn't be forced, the user shouldn't be forced to write something else that's not in this list. Uh, when you get list of errors in, in your editor, this should be correct list of errors, the same list of errors that you will get from compilation problem. And yes, I'm looking at its Scala. <laughs> uh, it should be context aware. Tooling should be context aware, so it should be focused on what is user actually doing at the moment? As I've mentioned this object browser example from Visual Studio because that's my favorite example of how Visual Studio is broken. Uh, object browser is totally disconnected from the place in code that you are. It's, it's not showing you information in the context of your current file, of your current function. It's showing you some random different information. Uh, and of course we would love our tooling to be responsive, so as fast as possible, because if you hover on something, you want to, to get tooltip as fast as possible. Uh, and the interesting thing here is that I haven't written performant, because actually uh, it doesn't matter too often to, to us. We are software developers, we have powerful machines with 32 gigabytes of RAM, and we cry if, if Apple doesn't include more RAM in, in, in MacBook Pros. So 
So performance itself is not as, Im as important. What is important is performance that's perceived by the user. So, so something that you've seen, you, you don't, your flow can't be broken, shouldn't be broken by, by the fact that you need to wait for something. The fact that it's using a lot of memory under the hood, that's probably a detail that you usually don't, don't care about. And this context of those, those, those couple of features, this compiler 101 approach to the design of compiler is probably considered harmful is, is, is wrong, uh, wrong description because that's just meme. But uh, it's not the best base for building this compiler one on one batch mode approach and black, bo black box approach to the, to the compilers. It's not best, best way, it's not the best base on top of which you can build modern editor tooling that, that, that has all those features that I've mentioned before. Uh, yeah, so for example, of course, if, you, if everything is black box, you kind of don't, don't get any information from it. So the only, only thing that you have is list of files at the beginning and, and something, some output at the end. Uh, so this is limited access to information. This is, this is not responsive because you need to do a whole compilation process to, 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 to get to update state of editor tooling. And obviously there are multiple languages that still have tooling like that. And the people always tell me, oh, this tooling is fine, it's, it's fine. Uh, but when we, when we think about modern editor tooling in context of mainstream languages, C Sharp, Java, TypeScript, JavaScript, uh, languages like that. Uh, there is this great, great sentence from, from my friend, Philip. He's a project manager at .NET team in Microsoft. He's working on, on tooling, on Visual Studio tooling. Compiler needs to be a server, it needs to be an API, and it needs to be a database. Uh, and what I mean by that, what he means by that. So server, it needs to be a long running process. It's not only executable that you send files it's done its thing, it process died. It cannot be like that. It needs to be something that's long running that you can call multiple times. So it needs to be API. It needs to provide you ability to call, uh, call things, call some actions, execute some actions multiple times while the compiler life cycle is still, while, while compiler still lives. And this, this thing has really huge implications on the design of the compiler because it totally changes the way we think about memory in compiler. It totally changes how we think about uh, performance in compiler, how we think about data access in compiler. It needs to also be a database. So you have to give users ability to somehow query internal state of the compiler. And when you do that, you usually come to, to uh, architecture of tooling that looks, editor tooling that, that looks more or less like that. And this is usually a simplification, but it's, it should be good enough for us. Uh, so on the one hand, we have compiler that's hopefully following those, those principles. Uh, then we have something called language server. And language server works as a communication layer between compiler and external world, because compiler, even if it's created as a long running process as, or as a library that's designed to be hosted in long running process, if it's API, it's usually API for this particular ecosystem that compiler is running on. So, so C Sharp and F Sharp compilers are .NET libraries. You can, yes, you can host them in long running process, but as a .NET library. Your editors at the other hand, uh, usually are not, well, they can run at multiple different, uh, they have multiple different platforms, they have multiple different languages that they are using for extension systems. So uh, yes, Visual Studio, for example, is using .NET. This means that for Visual Studio, you can reference the .NET, the, the C Sharp or the F Sharp compiler directly. And I'm using C Sharp and F Sharp as an example because that's my background, but that's the same true is about Java. The same is true about JavaScript and TypeScript compilers. Uh, but for example, if you want to have a tooling for F-sharp or C-sharp in Visual Studio Code, 
system, then we have totally different situation. Visual Studio Code is running on, on Node.js. It's, it's using JavaScript for extension platform. You cannot directly reference .NET library from JavaScript code. So language server is this, this, this pro program put on top of the compiler that's hosting compiler as a long running process uh, that provides a communication, communication layer. Uh, then we have, we have editor plugin, which is also basically very often just a communication translation step adapter or bridge uh, because it transforms the what language server gives you into something that editor can understand. Every editor has its own extension API, they, they are different, uh, but there, it's, it's just a translation step. It's just a step of plugging the, the what language server provides you into editor, maybe creating some UI, some additional UI, uh, things like that. Uh, language servers usually communicate, are designed to communicate through, uh, very often through standard input output and just posting. Uh, writing stuff to the console. Uh, they're really often using also uh, just sockets, if possible. I've seen some of them using just normal HTTP protocol. I've actually created one using HTTP protocol for a while, uh, which was really a good idea at the time, but we moved on. Uh, no, but well, so, 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 so HTTP protocol uh, was interesting because and I'm totally going off script right now. Uh, so HTTP protocol was interesting because our main target were Atom and, and, and Visual Studio Code, both of them using JavaScript as a, as a language of choice for extensions, and handling uh, HTTP calls from JavaScript is pretty easy, so, so that's why we've used uh, HTTP. That was not the best choice for Vim and Vmax, obviously. Uh, Okay, but this, this kind of brings us to the problem. And imagine that this world where every, every language, and we have millions of languages, implements their own language server. Every have their own protocol, different names for the functions, different way of serializing data, and, and, and multiple different things that can be different in your own implementation. <coughs> On the other hand, you have also whole bunch of editors, and you would like to support as many of them as possible. Uh, I guess like there are like five or six of the most popular editors, and you would like to support them all. Unfortunately, every single one of them is different in terms of different programming language they use, different programming model. So we have this m times n problem here. Yeah, you need to create like multiple connections, and, and, and stuff goes wrong. Th this is like difficult in context of ecosystem. It's difficult in context if your language server vendor is really difficult because you need to be sure that your API can be consumed nicely from all different editors. As I've mentioned, we decided to go with HTTP. That was good for Visual Studio Code. It was bad choice for uh, everything else. So you need to be careful about making such decisions. Uh, and then, Couple of years ago, two, three years ago, I don't really remember, uh, Microsoft has came up with something called language server protocol, which is the topic of our talk. And, and that was pretty long uh, introduction to the topic, but, <laughs> but we are on time, I think. So language server protocol is a communication protocol. It specifies the communication between language server and the editor plugin. So it's, it's standard, it's standardized this communication, which means that you now can implement language server, your language server can implement this particular communication standard and you hope that it will automatically works with, with multiple different editors. Uh, it's using under the hood, it's using JSON RPC uh, for serialization of data and it's using standard input output for communication or it can use also network socket, sockets, which is uh, sometimes used, especially if, if you want to host your language server in cloud. I think Microsoft just announced something, Visual Studio Online, I believe, which basically is built around the idea of, of hosting language server in cloud and then using your local editor or editor in browser. Uh, yes, the, the protocol itself is created, was created, or 
Nokia is, is being developed by Microsoft. Uh, but it's, it's, there's strong cooperation with community uh, partners around that. I think the initial partner was Red Hat and someone else, I don't remember. But yeah, it's kind of like they are taking, take, taking input uh, from many, many different community partners. However, the, the reference implementation is still Visual Studio Code. So, so the, the process usually, if you want to get something new to protocol, is usually you need to create also implementation on Visual Studio Code side that kind of demos how the, the thing will work. And then if that's accepted, then it goes to protocol. So, so it's, I guess it would be hard to get something in the protocol that Visual Studio Code is not using. But yeah, it, it's working. Like the whole process is, is fine, I guess. Uh, so in this new, new brave world, we have situation like that. So instead of directly communicating this, 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 this arrows everywhere, we have Python, C Sharp, Haskell, whatever language you want, language server. It implements the language server protocol, which provides you communication for this st standard set of the, of the features like tooltips, autocomplete, go to definition, find all references, format document, format range, and, and all whole bunch of there's like 20 or, or, or 30 of, of those, those, those endpoints that you can implement. Uh, and editor, at the same time, it just needs to implement the communication bridge, not between every single, you, you don't need to create a Haskell plugin for Visual Studio Code, Haskell plugin for Emacs, and Haskell plugin for, for Vim. You just, for both Vim, Emacs, VS Code, you, there, there are implementations of language server protocol plugins, and then you can plug any LSP compliance server into such plugin. Uh, which means that basically in, in context of whole ecosystem, if you think about whole ecosystem as, as, as one thing, whole editor tooling ecosystem, it replaces M times N problem to M plus N, which is like order of magnitude better, which is great. Uh, so, so how it works under the hood? Uh, it's based around a couple of ideas. So here is example flow of what's happening under the hood. So first step, does it work? Yeah, that's work, awesome. So first step is that editor tool sends a notification to language server, oh, document was opened. Uh, oh, there's a couple, of, couple of, of things. There are two types of, 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 of messages, well, three types. One is notification, and notification is something that both server and, and tool can send, and it's something that doesn't require any response. It's just, okay, something happened. Uh, file was opened in editor, file was changed in editor. Uh, those can go both ways, so they can go from editor to, to language server, or can go from language server to editor, if, ed if language server wants to push something to editor. The, the, probably the main example of that is actually pushing diagnostic, which is those like red squiggles in your editor. Uh, so something happened, something happened here. Uh, language server is like asynchronously calculating errors because like it, it kind of depends on the language. It, it's, it's, it may be long process. If it's done, it publishes the, the diagnostic to the editor. And then editor is responsible for actually rep representing them in some nice way. Uh, and the other kind of, of, of messages is, is request and response. So there is something that was requested by editor and then language server needs to return some kind of response. So for example, here the request is go to definition. So you clicked F12 in your editor or whatever it is in, in IntelliJ or, and, and JetBrains IDs. And, and you need to, you kinda need to get some kind of response. This response can be failure. So language server can tell you that, okay, I haven't found the, 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 the definition where I should move to, uh, but it needs to be sent back. Okay, so those are example, uh, a couple of examples, messages that can be sent. This is a request for the uh, go to definition on some uh, C++ file. So as I've said, it's using JSON RPC protocol and JSON RPC is really uh, interesting protocol if you haven't seen that. So it basically, this method field defines the endpoint to which like request should go. Uh, 
which is kind of like, yeah, it's, it's RPC calls like in, in soap or, or back to in, in old days, uh, but with JSON. <laughs> Don't ask me why. Uh, and then every, every message has some set of parameters. In this particular case, it's, it's what's the text document. We've, do, we've done our action and it's, oh, we've, we've, we've pressed F12 while we were at use in use CPP file at this particular position. So, so your cursor in, in, in editor was at line three, character 12, you pressed F12, you send this as a something that happened to the, lang to the language server. Whoops. Uh, and this is, this is example response to this, this call. So there is ID, and uh, those IDs are the same because this is request and this is response to this particular request. If that would be notification, uh, then there wouldn't be ID, I think in case of notifications, ID is optional. Uh, okay, there is also concept of capabilities, uh, and capabilities are basically, it provides a way for both editor and server to tell you what set of features we support. So editors are different. Uh, not every single editor needs to implement every single uh, feature that's provided by language server protocol specification. For example, you may, uh, in Vim, you may not have a view for mm, go find all references. Or I'm just coming up with, with examples for, because I don't really know that exactly. But it's definitely possible that some editors don't have all features and it's also possible that not every language server protocol server is implementing all features because maybe it's, it's just not possible to implement in your language. Maybe it's just too advanced for your language. Uh, for, for a really, really long, long time, we didn't have, uh, really? Really? No, that's not possible. <laughs> huh. That's interesting. Haven't the talk should be like 50 minutes? Shouldn't it be 50 minutes? Half an hour. I'm huh, I'm totally confused by that. No, 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 no. I'm fighting for my time here. <laughs> <laughs> Next talk is 10.30. Yes, and then the questions. Oh, that's before questions, okay. <laughs> no, that's, that's fine. Uh, okay, so let's quickly go to the demo time. <coughs> this will be the, the quickest demo I've ever done, but yeah. Uh, and I need to turn this, yep. OSP sample, correct. Whoops. So this is the sample from Microsoft uh, uh, because that's kind of the, the easiest thing. So on the one hand you have, uh, and I'm using JavaScript here, uh, well, uh, TypeScript uh, here because I guess that's the, the something that most people kind of are more or less familiar with. Uh, I know that this is like a language agnostic, ecosystem agnostic conference, but I assume that JavaScript is kind of like something that everyone more or less can understand. Uh, yeah, well, no one can understand <laughs> JavaScript, but, <laughs> uh, but yeah. So, so on, on client side, you have, uh, in Visual Studio Code, you have a function called activate. You defined options of, of your server, language server protocol, which includes things like what's the path to the, to the, to the uh, server, uh, what's the transport layer. You also define client options. Uh, and important here in client options is this document selector thing, which tells you, oh, my language server works for these particular types of files. So my F -sharp language server only works for F -sharp files. If you press F12 in, in Java uh, file, it shouldn't do a call to, to, to my F -sharp server. Uh, and then you create, create client and start it. That's not, not really, really interesting. Uh, more interesting is, is, uh, is this, and I have live coding. This will be interesting. Yeah, my, my live coding is just inserting snippets, long snippets, so. Uh, 
it's kind of uh, the best of both worlds, I guess. The first thing that we need to implement, and the server here is implemented in, 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 in TypeScript, it's, it's running on Node, uh, so it's really like easy for, uh, easy for, for Microsoft to provide really good API for both client and server in this particular case, uh, because that's something that they use internally also for in Visual Studio Code for, for the TypeScript support, which is kind of driving all, all stuff forward. So without going to into details because we don't have too much time, yeah, I will steal some time, don't worry about that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Awesome. I was, I was, I was literally convinced that it's 50 minutes. <laughs> uh, so first thing is on initialize call. And there's like a whole bunch of those calls. I'll, I won't go into, into all, the, all details. Uh, just show you a couple of sample ones. Uh, first one is on initialize. This is the one that you actually is required for you to implement. Uh, it's, it's getting some initialized parameters and it returns the capabilities of your server to the client. So as you see here, this, this basically, especially these lines, are showing you, okay, my editor is supporting something called resolve provider, uh, which again, not going into details, but you can, you can kinda understand what's, what's going on here. For example, if, if, your, uh, if you would support formatting in your, in your language server protocol, you would add something like document formatting provider and, and say, okay, we support this particular provider. And this means that client can send particular type of messages to your language server. Uh, this is not important, but I will just insert that. Oops. Yeah, this is awesome. This is awesome. Uh, okay, so so first one is actually the one I want to talk about is communication. <laughs> uh, it's configuration. So in Visual Studio Code and in any other probably in any other editor, you can have your own configuration files that kind of define something. Uh, and you want to communicate if this configuration file has changed or if configuration in your IDE has changed, it doesn't necessarily need to be saved in a file. Uh, it can be somewhere ma in some magical place like in case of Visual Studio. Uh, yes, and you can, you can guess that I really love Visual Studio. <laughs> uh, so here we define the, the interface that represents our configuration. And then we have on did change configuration handler that tells us, okay, configuration has changed something, so we, we need to perform something. Uh, here we have an example of on did change content uh, handler, and this is basically invoked every time you've made any change in, to in your editor. Uh, what's kind of important about that, you need to be really careful about doing anything expansive here because it's actually invoked on, any, on, a, uh, on every keystroke. Uh, so yeah, it's not a problem to just handle the, 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 the fact that, okay, that there is like so, ma so many messages going through. That's not a problem, but you just need to be careful about, so, so the example I've done here, of val starting validation of text document on every keystroke, this is probably s totally wrong. Like you shouldn't do that. Uh, what we do is we actually start a timer here uh, and like kind of just detects, oh, if user had stopped writing for 500 milliseconds or maybe one second, then start validation. So user gets uh, an uh, error message in your editor. And I will quickly like insert also other stuff uh, because I just want to show you how it works. What is also really nice about doing that in Visual Studio Code is that all the tooling just works great because again, that's something that Microsoft is using internally. Uh, so uh, even if you target, if your main target is a different platform like Emacs or Vim, it's probably a good idea to just do it in Visual Studio Code just for sake of testing. Visual Studio Code, as I've mentioned, is also the reference implementation. It implements all possible features that are in protocol. So, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, okay. There is cancel. Yeah, my snippets were not perfect. <laughs> Let's try this again. Uh, and hope that this time, yeah, something will happen. So, so using Visual Studio Code is, is definitely just a good idea if you, if you develop any language server, no matter what's, what's the, the language, what, no matter what's, the, what's your main target. Uh, in this particular beautiful example, we work on the plain text files, txt files, and if there's any string that's uh, uh, written in capital cases uh, and longer than single single character there is like we insert a warning here which is pretty cool uh, and as you can see back to the, to the language server this is not like not a lot of code it, it's I'm rushing through it because I thought we have more time but uh, but yeah it's it's kind of just simple function that, that do some pattern ma do re re regular expression matching on on our text. Okay, let's go quickly to back to the presentation. Uh, I'm really sorry that I couldn't talk more about the demo. So good parts of language server protocol, it's an abstraction. So you don't need to think about communication anymore. You just can focus on, on funny parts, which is actual implementation of features funny and difficult parts. Uh, because communication is, is just something annoying and, and I, I have thousands of stories when we've changed something in language server in, la in our F -sharp language server back before we've implemented LSP support and we kind of forgot to, to tell Vim guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and they were angry at us. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, you know, the communication could change, like because I was adding new features and, and, and all this stuff, and, and we've changed communication, not thinking about implications. In case of language server protocol, you just don't have this problem. Communication is standardized, you just need to fit into standard. Uh, it means that there is common user from the editor part of, of, of equation, it means that there is common user experience. So, at, so Haskell plugin looks exactly the same as Java plugin in Visual Studio Code. Especially back in Atom days, uh, tooltip. When I when I when I implemented tooltips in in in, in F -sharp plugin in Atom, actually the tooltip itself it was like inserted with jQuery and appended to the to the to the HTML DOM of the editor because that's that's how that was the only only reasonable way to do that, and that was a couple of years ago. Maybe something has changed about Atom, uh, but that was reasonable thing to do couple of years ago, but the other plugin, TypeScript plugin, could implement it totally different, could, could, could have different look and feel for your tooltips, tool which meant that there was no this common user experience uh, across the different languages. Now it's a it's fixed problem because you have single implementation of language server protocol plugin, uh, and then it's, 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 it's fine. Uh, really good thing is this, ubiquitous language tooling support across different platforms, which means that Vim, Emacs, VS Code, Visual Studio, whatever, is supported by the same set of features uh, instead of, of having different different things for each other. And it's extendable, doesn't matter. But bad part is that it's an abstraction. So it may limit you if you are super, uh, if you are doing super advanced language tooling, like JetBrains uh, people, they are not using language server protocol because they tell us, Okay, this limiting. Uh, yeah, there's a couple of, of big, big, big stuff. Uh, it really helps smaller languages. I, I really want to, to focus on that because it kind of pushes those those communities into one correct direction, and people are focused on implementing that. Uh, I guess we don't have time for a question, <laughs> but I will be around if if you want to talk about me about the detail talking about developer experience. I will be around. My name is Chris. You can find me here, and thank you. Thanks, So Chris and I had a conversation about how long this talk was going to be. And I said to Chris, hey, Chris, are you going to be on time? Or are you going to run over? And he was like, if anything, I'm going to be under. And but I was uh, like, awesome. And uh, I was, I was we didn't talk about what we were both thinking. He was thinking 50 minutes, and I was thinking 30 minutes. Whoops. 
<laughs> but anyway, the good news is that we do have time for one or two questions. Okay, awesome. Um, Chris, thank you. You did so well, <laughs> especially under pressure of me going, eh, we need to kind of stop. So thank you. Well <laughs> done. Uh, do we have any questions? And I'm just going to say, questions need to be questions, folks. Please can we not have debates or comments or your personal opinion? Uh, if it feels like the question's going that way, I will ever so politely ask you to ask your question. We also have the wonderful Lizzie here at the front, our roving mic. So please don't ask your question until you have a microphone. We want everyone to hear you and hear what you're asking. So we have two hands up, so we're going to take both your questions. Uh, Lizzie, you pick whoever you want to go to first. <laughs> Uh, thanks. Um, you briefly mentioned JetBrains. Um, it sounds like there was a bit of a, like a conversation because uh, of all their IDEs. Do they have their own kind of language server protocol? That they yeah, use? they they have their own internal stuff uh, because they're all IDEs are based on one single engine. Uh, they do, I, and I don't want to go into too much details of that because it's just something I'm not too familiar with. With with, uh, but as far as I understand, they have their own. Uh, Representation. They have their own like protocol that they use across all the editors, uh, which means that they're able to optimize on top of this protocol, and that's why a lot of stuff is working really well in JetBrains. And that's why really often when they implement something in one language, it will be also pretty soon available in the other languages, because a lot of features they do are implemented on top of this common communication layer which means that they get it for free for multiple languages. Thank you. I'm just going to pass the mic to one. Okay. Um, thanks. For that was a really interesting talk. Um, as a web developer, I don't think about compilers a huge amount, but this is really interesting. It makes me think about it a little bit more. Do you think we're going to see a shift uh, in people like myself that get into compilers? Because if I can build it, from the other way around, from the tooling back to the compiler. So that's interesting. Uh, yeah, so, so I'm not sure about like huge compilers, like in terms of like huge programming languages, but I definitely think that, and I definitely had project like that when we had some custom domain specific language for our client because they had ability to do like some business intelligence where they could create their, their own graphs with really small domain specific language. And we actually implemented the browser-based uh, ID using language server protocol because it's there. It's, it's, it's something that we don't need to focus anymore on, 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 on UI. Uh, we get it for free. So I think that moving in this direction when this powerful editor tooling becoming more and more common as something embedded in your applications because you ex ex you, your users need some kind of domain-specific languages, I, I think that this is really nicely enabling things like that. I'm not sure about uh, if that will make people contribute to the, like C-sharp compiler because that's totally different story. That's kind of totally different complexity. Uh, I don't, personally, I don't contribute a lot to, to F-sharp compiler itself. I built on top, I built stuff on top of that. So, so yeah, I guess that's the answer. One more Fantastic. question. Fantastic. I think we're going to squeeze one more question in because we've had questions so far, which is wonderful, not comments. So that's great. Well done, everyone. Uh, so we just let the microphone get there. <laughs> we'll take this question and then we'll wrap up. Uh, thanks. Great talk. Um, so, what's the kind of state of LSP at the moment? How is it evolving? Is there lots of sort of changes coming in, or is it kind of stabilized and it's kind of considered done, or how does that kind of move forward? Uh, no, it, it is definitely evolving. So those are not breaking changes. So what it's in s what is in protocol right now, it's considered stable, but they're all time adding new endpoints and ex expanding protocol. Uh, mostly, as I've mentioned, in in a way, in similar way as they evolve Visual Studio Code. So if they add some new features to Visual Studio Code, and they add new features to Visual Studio Code all the time, if you if you follow their release notes every every month, uh, so they are adding new stuff to, to LSP all the time. Brilliant. <laughs> Is, can it be a really like super quick question and you need to wait for the microphone to reach you? Otherwise everyone can't hear you. And we're all about inclusivity here today. 
it's a very nice talk. Uh, extension to the question. You need talking Sorry, to extension to this question that uh, my, uh, the person asked. It's about how much testing has been done. I'm just asking about how much, where it has been already implemented and all that stuff, this LSP and all that. So is it uh, Microsoft is already using it or is it they are, they are not using it at all? Oh yes, uh, Microsoft is, is totally using it in Visual Studio Code as base for what they do for a TypeScript and JavaScript, which means that's probably one of the most widely used things in the world, uh, in the software development world. Uh, it's also used by multiple commercial, well, not commercial, but multiple different vendors of the tooling, uh, company projects like Gitpod, which is like online ID, uh, is using that. Visual Studio Online, which they've just announced, is, is using that under the hood. I believe they have some plans to also expand their Visual Studio support. So, because as I mentioned, it's not a problem from their point of view of C Sharp and, 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 and F Sharp, because okay, those are just .NET and, and they can use it directly. But for example, if you want to have Rust support in Visual Studio, it's easier to, to implement to, to implement LSP support in Visual Studio and, and use existing LSP protocol than invest into, into particular plugins for Rust in Visual Studio. So they're definitely using that a lot and, and there's definitely something that's going to stay. And as I've mentioned, there's a lot of community partners uh, involved into that, so, so it's not just them, uh, but they're mostly driving it forward, but with help of the community. Awesome. Well, let's give Chris a traditional round of applause, and then we're gonna try our Icelandic <laughs> clap in a minute. So let's go traditional first. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Chris. Thank you. Now, did everyone catch the Icelandic clap? Yeah, do, do, do we know? Because this is a new one on me as well. I'm going to be honest with you. So the, uh, the idea of an Icelandic clap is we clap in unison. It's one clap. together. So let me count down. I'll go three, two, one. Thank you. you. Brilliant. Well done. They are awesome. They are. Well done. And you're awesome too.